Pet Life Radio. This is Pet Life Radio. Let's talk pets. Is your pet stressed out? Does your pet need annual vaccines? Which pet is best for a child? Would you know if your dog was in pain? Pet Life Radio presents The Pet Doctor, where you'll learn everything about keeping your pet healthy and happy. From pet care, pet meds and grooming, to pet food, pet insurance and dental care, this is the place to find out everything there is to know about pet wellness. Whether you have a dog, cat, reptile or rabbit, you'll find answers for your pets straight from the vets because it's your pet. Health matters. Please welcome your pet doctor host, veterinarian media consultant and veterinarian, Dr. Bernadine Cruz. The debate over the need and safety of vaccines in pets and people seems to always be in the news. Is there risk worth their proponent benefits? Do vaccines cause autism in children? Do vaccines cause cancer in pets? You got your flu vaccine last year and you still came down with the flu. What gives? To answer questions on vaccines and pets is my guest, Liza Rudolph. She's a boarded veterinary technician specialist in canine and feline clinical practice, along with small animal internal medicine. She works in both general and referral practices, lectures, and publishes articles for pet owners and veterinary professionals. So honored to have her on the show today. We'll be right back after this short break. I love cleaning the litter box, said no one ever. Luckily, there's World's Best Cat Litter, the litter that promises less mess with less litter. Only World's Best Cat Litter uses the concentrated power of corn to quickly trap odors in tight clumps. And quick clumping means you never have to chisel or scrape the box. Less cleanup with less wasted litter? That's a litter bit amazing. Save $2 on World's Best Cat Litter. Visit www.saveonworldsbest.com. Let's Talk Pets on PetLifeRadio.com. Welcome back to the Pet Doctor on Pet Life Radio. The doctor is in and we'll see you now. Liza, thank you so much. This is a topic that I know you in your daily uh, dealings with pet owners and myself, we hear questions all the time. Absolutely. I hear it all the time. There's a lot of confusion and there's a lot of information and a lot of misinformation, unfortunately, on the Internet. So it's really important that we address these things appropriately and really educate our pet owners so that they can make the right decisions for their pets. Good. I know, for instance, I was vaccinated as a child for smallpox. You just don't see that disease around anymore. And people ask me, why do I have to have my cat vaccinated for rabies? It's totally indoors. Parvo, you know, I had a friend who had their dog vaccinated for Parvo and it came down with the disease or just really felt terrible after getting the vaccine. Leukemia seems to be rare. So why do pet owners still need to get their pets vaccinated? Number one. I think the biggest thing to remember is that even though that a lot of these diseases, we're seeing them less and less frequently over time, that they have not been completely eradicated. And I think that that is especially important, especially when we're talking about our feline patients. You know, when a lot of these cats come from from shelters, they're not coming from breeders, don't know what their history was ahead of time. And there's lots of feral or wild uh, colony cats that are out there. And unfortunately, they like to spread disease to one another because they are not properly vaccinated. So what we need to remember is that even though we're seeing a downward trend in these diseases, that they are still present in the environment. And yes, I will agree with you in that the likelihood of your pet contracting, let's say, leukemia is significantly less now than it was, let's say, 20 years ago. But I think it's really important that we don't become overly complacent or get a false sense of security. Especially, I've seen time and time again from owners when a pet, for example, just to use leukemia as that example, bring that pet in and they find that the the pet has been infected and they feel awful because it's a preventable disease. And I don't like to see that because obviously as pet owners, we want to make the best decisions for our pets and we want to make sure that they're cared for appropriately. So especially when we have a preventable disease that can cause significant health effects, it's really important that we just remember that these things are still out there. They haven't completely disappeared yet. So still an issue. 
I think it's always fascinating and love watching the news and seeing what's happening in the medical aspect, human side, and polio. I mean, yes, polio previously was just devastating in the United States, and it's basically been eradicated. So you go, okay, it's not out there anymore. But there are still pockets in the world where polio is still prevalent, is still causing problems. And now people traveling as much as they are, they can have disease carried from one country to another. And pets are also traveling a lot too. So there are diseases that can be brought in that, as you're right, we need to continue to be vigilant and to protect our pets. Absolutely. I agree. I agree 100%. And it's interesting that you bring up polio and how at least in, you know, the United States in in most, you know, first world countries, for lack of a better term, that we just don't see it anymore. And I think the last I checked, I believe that it's still prevalent in three countries, one of which, and I may be speaking out of turn, I can't remember if it is Afghanistan, but one of the countries in that area actually started a vaccination program that significantly brought down the amount of polio cases that they're seeing. So if we are aggressive and really want to eradicate a disease, it's certainly possible. It's just a matter of being vigilant. And I'm misspeaking (laughs) of being vigilant and being aware that if it's not completely gone, it's still a risk. The risk is less over time, but it's definitely still there. One of the things that people are always concerned with is you have that little poodleette whose feet never touch the ground and is always in mom's arms. And then you have the kid that's out there hiking and biking and having a great time and getting out into wildlife. So vaccinating these pets according to lifestyle. I think vaccines, and you'll agree, have changed so much in the veterinary field as to which vaccines are necessary for which pets and how frequently they need to be given. Because I know when I first got into veterinary medicine, basically all vaccines were given every year and now it's much less frequent. So I'd love to have you chat a little bit about that indoor cat and that dog that maybe just walks the neighborhood, why it's still important to get them vaccinated. Sure, absolutely. And I think what's what's important to understand is that when we're talking about vaccine recommendations, we do have two different sets of generalized guidelines for most pets. And we try to separate vaccines to make them more understandable into different categories. And one of the categories that we use is core. And your core vaccines are those that, well, first of all, are mandated by law. So that would, a great example would be rabies. That is a public safety issue and it is a fatal disease that is prevented by vaccination. So we would consider that a core vaccine. Other core vaccines would be those that cause significant disease. They're highly infectious and the vaccine itself is considered very low risk. So for these core vaccines, we really consider them appropriate for most of the general pet population. Now, of course, we're going to do a risk assessment because as you mentioned, we have, let's say the, for example, the two pound teacup chihuahua that lives on the Upper East Side on the 35th floor that literally never goes outside. And then we have, let's say a two year old German short hair pointer that is an active hunter and they're in the woods in the Northeast they are going to have a completely different set of potential risks and exposures. So we do need to take these things into consideration. And that's when we start talking about something called non-core vaccines. And these are vaccines that we only consider for those that are at risk. So a good example that I think a lot of people are familiar with is the Bordetella bronchoseptica vaccine. And that vaccine is commonly called the kennel cough vaccine. And certainly if you have a pet that truly never leaves the house, doesn't congregate with any other dogs. They don't go to the dog park. They're not boarding. They're not grooming. They don't go to PetSmart. It's fairly unlikely that they are going to contract Bordetella, which is one of the many kind of canine infectious upper respiratory diseases. So in that situation, maybe that's not an appropriate vaccine for that particular dog. But if I have a dog that's going to dog shows and fraternizing with other dogs, Because kennel cough or Bordetella specifically is very communicable from dog to dog, I don't want my dog to get sick. So we do a risk assessment and realize that this is a good vaccine for this particular kind of dog. You could follow that same logic and talk about, let's say, the German short hair pointer that's hunting. Perhaps the Lyme vaccine is a good 
vaccine for that dog, but certainly not the teacup chihuahua. So we do take these things into consideration. What I'd like to, I don't want to exclude our feline pets because our cat patients are so, so very important. With the cats, many of them don't leave the home. So I think it's important that we understand that some cats do live inside, some live outside, and some spend time in between. What's interesting is when we talk about rabies and leukemia, we still have to keep these things in mind. And especially with rabies, we talk about our small animal patients, so meaning our canine or our feline patients, and we compare across the country which patient is more likely to contract rabies. It's cats hands down, are more likely to contract rabies than their canine counterparts just because they have a completely different lifestyle. And especially, we know that we try not to maybe let our cats out, but sometimes they just sneak out and we're doing the best we can. But we have to remember that if they sneak out, that's when your exposure becomes a risk because maybe they have never left the house before and they're not vaccinated, so now they're at risk. And I think that's an interesting segue to the feline leukemia virus and the vaccine, because actually that vaccine is actually considered by the American Association of Feline Practitioners to be a core vaccine for kittens only. And that's because kittens, if they're exposed to feline leukemia, if they're under six weeks of age, the likelihood of them contracting it, I believe, is around 85%. I didn't need to pull Amazing. the papers, but last I checked, it was 85%. As the cat becomes older, especially when they hit that year mark, it takes a huge drop, and really it drops to between 10 and 15%. So we know that as these cats get older, they do form a little bit of a natural resistance to this disease. Unfortunately, we know that the kittens are more likely to contract it, and just like in people, if you get sick and you're a very young patient, you're more likely to suffer those really ill effects. You're going to get sicker, you're going to get sicker faster, it's going to last longer, and unfortunately, sometimes they don't necessarily pull through depending on what they've been exposed to. So we need to protect our little ones. So what we're recommending is in these little kittens that we go ahead and protect them against leukemia because you never know, maybe somebody lets the, you know, leaves the door open and the cat escapes for a day. And if that happens, at least they're protected. And then when you come back a year later as a young cat and you see your veterinarian, we have a conversation and we basically do a risk assessment. And if that patient isn't going outside and they've never escaped, well, frankly, we probably don't need to continue vaccinating against leukemia, but we did protect them during that first year, you know, when kittens are super active and they turn into unruly teenagers and they make escapes. So I think it's really important to, again, to realize that there are risk assessments and that there are guidelines in place to help us with those risk assessments. Liza, I totally agree with you. And along the same vein, it's happened here in my portion of Southern California where a rabid bat, and bats are one of the big carriers in my area, a rabid bat got into the house and the cat just thought, wow, a bird made it in the house and it's not even flying all that great. I can chase it. I can play <laughs> with it. And the cat was exposed to rabies. So I'll always make sure because not every municipality requires requires that cats be vaccinated for rabies. So I said, even if it's not required by law for your cat's protection for its long-term health and for the health of the family too, get them vaccinated for rabies. Absolutely. It's just such a devastating disease and nearly 99.9% .9 fatal. I truly don't think it's worth it for our pets or from a public health standpoint. I really don't. Liza, another thing I think that's really important is you and I got vaccinated as a child and, you know, there are certain core vaccines and we never get them boosted throughout our lives. But now I have a client that comes in. And I said, OK, it needs to have its distemper adenovirus parvo vaccine. And now that it's an adult boosted every three years and they look at me like you're just trying to make money. I don't have to get vaccinated again, boosted. Why does my pet? And the answer to that one? <laughs> the answer to that one is a little bit gray. I'll be a little bit honest with you. So all these vaccine recommendations, and as you alluded to earlier, you know, let's say 10, 15 years ago, we boosted all of these vaccines annually, right? Every single year you boosted these vaccines. 
Well, as time went on, you know, as vaccine companies decided to do more research, we're finding that a lot of these core vaccines specifically have duration of immunity at least to three years, which is why some of these vaccines have switched to an every three-year schedule. But some of these components we found in certain patients are actually good five to seven years, but it's not consistent. And that's why they're only labeled for three years. Now, we have a lot more research on the human side. So that gives us a better idea on how long these vaccines actually last. You know, a good example would be tetanus. We get our tetanus booster in theory every 10 years, and it should be reboostered every 10 years because we know the vaccine will last that long. Unfortunately, we don't know exactly how long some of these vaccines last, especially those core vaccines. Certainly the last three years, maybe they'll last longer, but we just don't have the data. And because these core vaccines protect against those diseases that cause significant disease and are highly infectious, we can't necessarily take that risk. And that's where it becomes, becomes a judgment call especially if you're nervous about over-vaccinating. But what's great is that we do have the option of using titers to try to measure a patient's immunity. So those can be part of the, of the all-over picture when you're doing your risk assessment to see if a patient has an immune response or has continued immunity to a particular disease. So if I have a client who says, I don't want to over-vaccinate my pet, I agree it needs to be done, but If there's still immunity in its system, I don't want to vaccinate it again. So I want to do a titer, except for rabies, because as I understand, most municipalities will not accept a rabies titer as being protected. They still need to be vaccinated. But say for parvo, they want to see if the pet is still protected. Can they say for sure if the titer is within a certain limit that yes, it is protective? Yes and no. Again, gray area. And and immunology is absolutely fascinating, but titers are definitely have their value, but you have to know what they mean. So in that situation, the patient comes back, let's say three years later, they're due for their Parvo vaccine. Well, we want to see if their previous Parvo vaccine is still protective. So yes, we can do a titer. And if we have a titer that comes back positive, it means that as of that moment in time, it's just a snapshot that that patient is indeed protected against parvo. Now, this is where it gets tricky. (laughs) So we know they're protected at that point of time, but we've already gone beyond the guaranteed three years that we know that vaccine is good for, right? So when does that protection begin to wane? In truth, If we took that same dog and measured it maybe two weeks later, two months later, eight months later, two years later, it may, at any of those points, that titer could drop down. The issue is that we can't measure how long that titer will stay at a protective level, and there's no way to be able to measure that. The other thing is that there's two arms or two categories of the immune system, and what that titer measures is something called humoral immunity, and that's well and that's good. So if you have a positive a positive test, you know you're protected, but you don't know how long it's going to last. Additionally, there's a whole other section of the immune system called cell-mediated immunity, and we can't test that. So there's a lot of questions. It can be helpful, but we just need to realize that perhaps even in the face of a positive titer, if we have a patient that's in a high risk, that maybe it might be worth vaccinating because we never know when that protection is going to drop off. Mm. Great answers. I'm speaking right now with Liza Rudolph. She is a boarded veterinary technician specialist in canine and feline clinical practice, along with small animal internal medicine. That's why she sounds so smart. We're going to be right back after this short break and talk more about vaccines. Please have a seat in the waiting room. The doctor will be with you shortly, right after these messages. Does your dog itch, scratch, stink, or shed like crazy? Come to Dynavite for help. Order a 90-day supply of Dynavite. Pick up two bottles of Licker Chops, get the third bottle free. New improved Licker Chops with omega-6, omega-3, vitamin E, and now six extra direct-fed microbials. Even better for the digestive tract and immune system. And dogs love it. Try Licker Chops. Buy two, get one free. This is Henry Lukasiewicz for Dynavite. D-I-N-O-V-I-T-E dot com. Let's talk pets. Let's talk pets on Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. <laughs> dot com. <laughs> 
Welcome back to the Pet Doctor on Pet Life Radio. The doctor is in, and we'll see you now. Liza, this is fascinating because he's answering all the questions that I know clients are always asking me. You brought it up in the beginning, too, about the chihuahua getting vaccinated versus a larger dog. Yeah. You drop the vaccine, <laughs> and they look at that quantity that's in the syringe and going, oh, but my pet's little. You're giving it too much. And we're told we're supposed to give the same amount to a 120-pound Great Dane versus that three-pound chihuahua. That doesn't make sense. How can I make sense to my clients? <laughs> that is an excellent question. And it does get very confusing. And it's a little bit difficult for even us in the veterinary field to wrap our brains around. And I think a lot of that is because when we think about dosing, we usually think about medications, right? So mm-hmm. we know that when we go to our doctors and we get an antibiotic, we know that as a child, when we were eight years old, since we were smaller, we got a significantly smaller dose than we did as an adult because we got bigger. Unfortunately, medication dosing and the dosing for vaccines is completely different. And I know that sounds counterintuitive, but it really is. And that's because basically, no matter what size the dog is, they have the same size immune system. Stick with me with this. (laughs) So the number number of antigen-specific lymphocytes is not greater in larger canines, in larger dogs. So it doesn't matter. And the best way I have to explain this is think about it on a basic level. Let's forget about vaccines. If I am a small chihuahua or a very large Great Dane, it doesn't matter if I get exposed to a hundred, let's say bacteria, germs to make me sick, or a hundred thousand of them. No matter what happens, my immune system as a Chihuahua and as a Great Dane is going to react the same way. Now, that being said, if I got exposed to a very high burden of a particular bacteria, I would probably get sicker faster and it might be more significant, but it's not going to change the way my immune system works. And that's the key. That's what we have to remember is that the immune system is going to respond the same no matter what. Fascinating. So you have this big pet, little pet, they get exposed, they need their vaccines. And again, you're talking about lifestyle. Who determines which vaccines they're supposed to get? You mentioned the American Association of Feline Practitioners. Is there an overarching group? I know typically I'll tell clients that we follow the standards of the American Animal Hospital Association. Correct. Yes. So it depends actually where you live and it depends if we're talking about cats or dogs. So if we're talking about dogs, the guidelines that have come out and they've actually just been recently updated as of September 5th, 2017, they were recently updated by the American Animal Hospital Association. And that group determines the guidelines for dogs and what's appropriate as far as core versus non-core and to help guide you in risk assessment and also to help you interpret titers. So there's a lot of things that they have to do. And, you know, I always like to tell people that when we're talking about an overarching organization making recommendations, it's not some guy in an ivory tower that works for a pharmaceutical company or anything like that. It's a very large group of veterinarians, of immunologists, of epidemiologists that are looking at the evidence that we have and looking at trends and looking at risk factors and making a guideline between all of them. So it's it's not just one person making a recommendation. Now, if we're talking about cats, the American Association of Feline Practitioners are the ones that make the recommendation for cats. So it depends what species you're talking about. And it also depends on where you live. So there is something that's called um, WASAVA, and that's the World Small Animal Veterinary Association. And their guidelines are very, very similar to both AHA and AAFP, as we call those overarching organizations. The World Small Animal Veterinary Association does address both canine and feline. And it's interesting to look at, but what we have to remember is that it's a world recommendation, and it's not going to take into consideration things that are specific to North America. But as far as a lot of our core vaccines, they're actually the same recommendations around the world. And there's also a board in Europe for cat diseases as well. And pretty much across the board, we're essentially on the same page in terms of risk factors. So that's where all those guidelines come from. Speaking of world, thank you. It's a good segue. Oftentimes people think very locally of vaccinating their own pet and protecting their pet, but protecting 
a dog or a cat from certain diseases also protects our wildlife, where I know it's in Africa, one of the greatest sources of rabies that's going into wildlife and it's killing them is coming from the domestic dog, and it's also affecting people. So there really is this one world, one health, one medicine by keeping the entire population of people and pets healthy through vaccines. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's it's really so interesting. And what we also have to be aware of, too, is, yes, there's certain diseases that, you know, maybe only cats get and only dogs get. But there's also diseases that cross species lines. It was in Africa that they actually had an outbreak of distemper virus, but it was in their big cats, you know, lions and tigers. And we don't have a lot of those. So we don't want them getting sick and we don't want them dying. So as part of that effort to try to protect those big cats, they actually started rounding up some of the dogs and the wild dogs that are roaming in the area and vaccinated them against distemper. And that actually increased the immunity of the entire area and actually helped to reduce the spread of that disease in that area, which I think is absolutely fascinating. Speaking of being sick from vaccines or being sick and then getting the vaccine and the opposite, vaccines oftentimes I'll vaccinate a pet and I will just automatically say, don't be surprised if your pet might not be a little bit under the weather for the next 24 hours or so. Someone like a human child or even you and I getting vaccinated, you can sometimes feel a little bit off. That off actually is a good sign that the vaccine is working. Isn't that correct? Absolutely. Absolutely. The entire reason that we're giving these vaccines is to try to mimic the immune response as opposed to them getting infected. So we don't want them to be exposed naturally, get infected, and then get sick. But with vaccines, we want to have the exposure part so that the immune system kicks into gear, but we don't have the sick part. So sometimes, and more often than not, we want to see or we would anticipate to see a little bit of lethargy, this patient being a little bit off, a little bit tired because that's telling us that the immune system has been activated. And we want that immune system activated because if it isn't, we might be concerned that maybe, you know, that that vaccine isn't going to have the appropriate immune response. Now, certainly you and I both know that not every pet will show any kind of side effects, but it's really not uncommon for them. And as nine times out of 10, you know, it's pretty self-limiting if they're managed within a day of a day at home, maybe just quiet and let them relax. I feel that most of them are pretty much okay. And in the same vein, I'll talk to people about, for instance, flu vaccines for humans. And I said, oh yeah, you know, did you get your flu vaccine this year as they're sniffling their nose and trying to expose me to something in an office call? I said, oh no, I don't believe in flu vaccines because, you know, two years ago I got the flu vaccine and immediately I got the flu. So the flu vaccine gave me the disease. And your thoughts? My thoughts on that. So it, I think what we have to have to remember is that when we were vaccinated against, especially upper respiratory disease, there's a lot of upper respiratory diseases out there, first of all. So even though I was potentially vaccinated against this particular strain or strains of the flu, it doesn't necessarily prevent me from being exposed to other things that may cause similar symptoms. So it's certainly possible that you have been, you know, infected by or exposed to and then infected by something completely different while your immune system was busy, you know, working on this vaccine, which is what it should be doing. The other thing that we need to remember is that, like I said, there's a lot of different diseases out there. And a good example to bring this back to to the veterinary side is I mentioned kennel cough vaccine or Bordetella. A lot of people think that kennel cough and Bordetella mean the same thing. But really, kennel cough is kind of a catch-all term for, you know, a canine upper respiratory disease process, which can have eight, nine, ten different pathogens that can cause very similar symptoms. So it may not necessarily be that the vaccine didn't work. It's that you were infected by something else. Alternatively, it could also be that we need to understand the goals of the vaccine. So whereas a rabies vaccine, its goal is to prevent infection and disease, the goal for a vaccine like, let's say, Bordetella bronchoseptica or the kennel cough vaccine, the goal is a little different. We're not necessarily trying to 100% prevent the disease. We're trying to lessen the symptoms so that if our patient is exposed or a pet is exposed, that they're not going to get as sick 
as they would have had they not gotten the vaccine. And, you know, when we talk about symptoms, we're talking about hacking, cough and sneezing and all that kind of stuff that aerosolizes these droplets into the air. And that's how your other, these other dogs get the disease. So by vaccinating, even if the patient's exposed and shows some clinical signs, they're not going to be as sick as they were if they weren't vaccinated and we're lessening the spread of the disease itself. Speaking definitely of these upper respiratory, I know we have been really agonizing at my own practice about bringing in the canine influenza vaccine. Because we know there's been areas, Chicago in particular, had a huge outbreak. Florida had an outbreak too. And it seems to be popping up into different areas. We have some of the vaccine on hand. We're not making it part of our core vaccines. But we're telling people that We know it's out there that these pets are basically viral virgins. They've never seen this before. So they're a much greater risk of having this disease cause problems. But we can't tell if it's canine influenza or is this kennel cough or is it Bordetella? Sure. Absolutely. It's a tough decision to make. And, you know, it really, I think, has to do a lot with the area. Like you said, that if there are outbreaks, if it's a higher risk, then certainly it's probably worth a discussion. But I do think that when you get into those gray zones, you're exactly right. It's worth a discussion because when we get into these gray zones, it's when the veterinarian and the pet owner have a discussion and make a decision for their pet as a team so that everyone's involved and everyone understands what the goals are and what the pros and the cons of a vaccine may be, especially like you said, when we're talking about canine influenza, because there are pockets of it. It's not everywhere, but these dogs do get pretty ill when they are infected. So we have to take all that into consideration. And getting ill, this I know has a low prevalence But when it happens and it happens to your pet, it can be very, very devastating. The vaccine-induced sarcomas, cancers, in the just a short amount of time that we have left, I'd love to have you address these cancers that pets get. And is it worth vaccinating your pet? This is such such a hard subject for me um, because when we're talking about injection site sarcomas, they are considered rare, okay? So first of all, they are considered rare adverse events. But if it's your pet, it doesn't matter how rare it is because it happened to your pet. So I understand the concern and I have the same concern for my own pets, specifically cats. Cats do have a higher likelihood of forming sarcomas in response to vaccines or other injections than dogs do. It actually has its own name. It's feline injection site sarcoma. It used to be called vaccine-associated sarcoma, but what we're finding is that it's actually not just caused by vaccines. There are other injectable medications that can elicit this response and cause sarcoma formation. We don't fully understand it yet, but what I can tell you is that feline injection site sarcoma is more prevalent in North America. They don't see it to the same degree in the UK or Europe or Australia. So this current thought process is that there is a genetic predisposition for some cats specifically in our area of the world because we're really not seeing it with any frequency anywhere else. It happens, but it's even more rare than it is in the United States. So I think, again, it's about risk assessment for these guys and knowing that really when it comes down to it, it's not just about vaccines. It could be any other, I don't want to say any other type, but there's at least five other types of other injectables that have been linked to the sarcoma formation. And if we're notating where these injections are given, we're giving them in spots where they're easily managed. I think that for my pets, I think that it's a reasonable risk when we're talking about something like leukemia, which can be a devastating disease, can affect their quality of life and can affect their life expectancy. So the odds are in my favor. I might lose one of these days, (laughs) but I really think that it's much less common than people think it is. And Liza, I totally agree with you. I have two cats and they're vaccinated. They're indoor kitties. And I know every once in a while these little stinkers will escape. So yes, I vaccinate my cats and I think it's quite appropriate that people vaccinate their pets. I've been chatting right now with Lisa Rudolph. She's a boarded veterinary technician specialist in canine and feline clinical practice, along with small animal internal medicine. Her knowledge of vaccines is astounding. And thank you so much. You answered a lot of questions that I had, so I know I'll be able to take it back 
to my own clients. So thank you so much, Liza. You're welcome. It was a pleasure. Well, this is Dr. Bernadine Cruz. You've been listening to The Pet Doctor on Pet Life Radio. If you have any questions that you'd like us to answer, I'll get those answers for you one way or the other. You can just drop your questions to the pet doctor at PetLifeRadio.com and I will get that on the air for you. So please tune in again next week. We'll give you more information on how to make you that best possible pet owner. Thanks for listening. Pets can be a wonderful addition to your life because they're a member of the family. Keeping them healthy and happy is important. Pet Life Radio presents The Pet Doctor with veterinary media consultant and veterinarian Dr. Bernadine Cruz. Whether you have a dog, cat, reptile, or rabbit, you'll find answers for your pets straight from the vets. The Pet Doctor, on demand every week, only on PetLifeRadio.com.